Hi, everybody. Welcome to a second episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi flying solo. For those of you who didn't listen to the Lori Vallow arraignment episode, I just put out a little while ago. Uh, again, Fruit Loops out of surgery, did well. She is home resting probably in a codone haze, taking her pain meds, getting a lot of rest from what I hear. So we wish her well. All right, before we get started, we're going to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. So you can go to twocooltshirtquilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. Check them out. They'll know we sent you. They can take your T-shirts and make them into a quilt or a pillow, if you can see behind me, and, well, make them into a quilt or a pillow. That is too cool. There you go. We appreciate you, Andrea and crew. So, this is just a continuation of the crazy day that Gigi has had, and uh, a good crazy day, though. Just, you know, lots happening. And by the way, if you see a little bump right here, totally ran into the, the door frame, just unprovoked, because that's what I do, y'all. Come on, you know how we are by now. Um, and if you don't know how we are, big welcome to our new listeners. We've gained a lot of listeners um, over the weekend with uh, some of the cases we've been covering. The big, big, big news today, y'all. Barry Morphew, nine days before jury selection. They were at a trial readiness conference for the May 3rd trial. The DA dismisses the case against Barry today with prejudice, so they can refile in the future if they choose to do so. I think his bond will be returned back to him, that $500,000 bond. Now, he still has, uh, he has civil cases against officers he also has those, I believe they're misdemeanor charges where he voted for Suzanne when she was presumably dead. And, um, but I mean, the big ones are gone. And can I just say right now, I would totally hate to be the secretary in that DA's office for the next few days. You know, they are going to eat those phone lines up. People are so mad. We're going to talk about it at the end of that. But first off, the prosec in the filing, the prosecution said law enforcement believe they are close to discovering Suzanne's body in a mountainous location close to the Morphew home. Due to the fact that the area is currently under five feet of snow, they're unable to search for her. And if they were to find her, there wouldn't be enough time to have her body autopsied and the necessary forensic test be performed in time for this trial, which is a couple of weeks away. Nine days till jury selection. I mean... Wait till the last minute. So the motion said in typical homicide cases, the fact that the victim's death is rarely at issue. But in a case such as this, the most, inf the most influential fact of consequence is whether or not Miss Morphew is deceased. And I thought that that was pretty telling. Um, I mean, nobody, you know, I guess that that is something that could put reasonable doubt in jurors' minds right there. Look, it's no question the prosecution, they derailed a long time ago. And just recently, the biggest blow to the prosecution was, I think, what, uh, 10 to 12 expert witnesses. My numbers may be off, but it was kind of that, that same area. Uh, can't testify as expert witnesses. So that's devastating their case. And um, I, I, I'm still blown away. I've seen so many people. I think some true crimers going to have to go to therapy because of this. People are really upset. They also cited the judge not allowing them to call most of their expert witnesses, um, saying they excluded the people's best evidence to move forward in this case by severely limiting our experts' testimony. Even if the court were to partially reconsider its position on the need for such severe sanctions at this late hour, the people would still be left with several key expert witnesses initially endorsed. Without this crucial evidence and without the victim's body, the people cannot move forward at this time in good faith. And they go on to say ethics demand that prosecutors proceed to trial only in circumstances where a reasonable likelihood of success exists which given the court's current rulings and the uncertainty of any future rulings is impossible to completely ascertain. Suzanne's sister, this is interesting to me. Suzanne's sister, Melinda agreed with the decision saying she expressed her wishes that we ultimately resolve absolutely 
whether or not her sister is dead prior to further prosecution. And her two brothers also agreed on that, which got me wondering, uh, did they doubt that she's dead or is this just something they have to put in there to justify throwing the case right now? Now at a press conference after the hearing, Barry's attorney said that the, uh, the state had no physical evidence tying him to the murder, despite terabytes and terabytes of information given to them. And she also said DNA was found linked to unknown males, included, including convicted sex offenders on Suzanne's bicycle, her helmet inside the Morphew home, and also in her vehicle. They said they chose to ignore all that and focus on Barry. She said, we were going to get Mr. Morphew acquitted rightly after a trial that we believed we were going to have to have. But now, all of a sudden, today, in the face of the fact that, that they have committed so much misconduct, they decided to dismiss the case, claiming that there is a body they are close to finding up in the mountains that is snow-covered nearby where Mr. Morphew's house was. So, you know, I've been talking about this a little bit especially with my buddy Eric over there, the docket on Twitter. I really have felt that this was a very flimsy case at best with what they had. And to convince 12 people that he killed her on circumstantial evidence with no body. I mean, even though to all of us, it seems very obvious what happened and it's a common sense thing. You may have one or two people on there that just are not going to, to agree and here's the thing. You lose the case, but he can never be retried. You find Suzanne's body and it has something written on it. Barry killed her. I was here. You can't try him again. I really do think that with, with the state of the case that they had, this was the best decision. And it's a tough one. But if they really think they know where Suzanne is at, okay, go find her. Do some tests. And then... Re you know, bring the charges back. It's crazy, y'all. I was not expecting this today. It came right, right in the middle, I think, of Chad's hearing. And so I'm like a chicken with my head cut off because it's hard to keep up on all the craziness. So we are going to move up to Orsoya Gal uh, up in New York, the 51-year-old mother who was found brutally stabbed inside of a hockey bag close to her home the nypd has offered a three thousand five hundred dollar reward for any information about her murder um, that surveillance video when i did the last video we'd only seen the still the surveillance video was it's grainy you you don't see a facial feature i did think that it had the stance of a man uh, the walk for me uh, you know, everybody's looked at it and seen something different, but I think a lot of people really were thinking the 13 year old son, but I'm going to tell you, he's 13. I, I, I just don't see it. Another thing too, is whoever murdered this woman, they are likely to have cuts and scrapes all over them because unfortunately when you stab somebody and blood gets on the knife, it is very slippery. 58 to 60 times stabbing that, that knife was probably covered and I'm sure they have some injuries. So that was the one thing when they released the sun, I thought, yeah, you know, they're going to look for any kind of defensive scratches on the face or the neck of the arms cuts on the hand. And eh, you know, he's 13 probably wouldn't think to wear gloves. He probably would have had them all over really seems like, uh, this kid maybe lucked out. And, uh, if he was upstairs asleep, I know my kids can sleep through, I mean, severe thunderstorms. So it's not out of the question. The other thing I was thinking about, this murder took place in the house. Can you imagine the forensic evidence, the DNA evidence? They maybe have found shoe prints, uh, bloody palm prints. It just doesn't seem planned to me. This seems very spur of the moment. I mean, the guy left a blood trail from the house to the body. It's, it's just tells me this was spur of the moment, rage, crime of passion, whatever you want to call it. And bless her heart, that had to have been just a terrible, terrible way to go. So WABC has reported that police have identified a person of interest who was a handyman who had access to the family home in Forest Hills. They haven't named him. Um, and they, 
they say they don't know if maybe this is the man who sources say she met at the Lincoln Center on Friday evening because prior to her murder, she was seen in the backyard that afternoon. And later that evening, she went to a show at Lincoln Center with friends. After that, she was seen at a local bar sitting by herself and spent about 40 minutes sitting there. People said it looked like she was waiting for someone before she left. And um, we don't really know why. Investigators believe she was killed on the first floor, then taken down to the basement. And, you know, if you if you look at her Facebook page, it's taken down now, but I've seen some shots of it. Uh, I mean, there were very happy photos of her and her husband and her boys. They were traveling. They had old wedding photos of them. And um, she posted a selfie on New Year's Eve with the caption, quote, hoping 2022 will be a great one, end quote. And, and things like that are very eerie to me, knowing what we know now. Uh, her 13-year-old son posted a YouTube video last month just before his bar mitzvah in honor of his late grandmother who had died of breast cancer when he was a baby. And uh, I've seen a lot of things about the 17-year-old son. Clearly, he's a music musician, and it's kind of that shock rock metal, um, blood on your mouth and that kind of thing. And uh, he was talented on the piano. And let's just say the the, the videos that he had up were... Um, graphic and odd and one of the songs I believe was called mother I'm not gonna judge it's you know kids get into their stuff I, maybe it's a coincidence it doesn't really seem like at the end of the day they're focusing on her sons or her husband at this point so I'm not gonna neighbors say she was a devoted mom to her boys and said she was really just an amazing person they had lived in that home for around 10 years and as we know, her 13-year-old son was handcuffed and detained, questioned, and then released. The family electrician says the home does have a camera surveillance system. And last night, there was videos of investigators. Um, they were seen on the main and the second floor in rooms collecting evidence. In fact, we think we saw um, somebody vacuuming. And they'll do that to get trace evidence. If you watch forensic files, and you guys know I do, they will find one little string and they'll, boom, find the murderer. But it seems like maybe they got somebody in mind, but still nobody named yet. Hoping this case uh, breaks open soon. I think maybe in the next day or two, we'll at least have a named suspect. It seems like they're heading in the right direction, but we'll keep an eye on it. Tomorrow, we've got some filings for M Marcus Spen Spanvello, who is the ex of Cassie Carley. Um, got some stuff today. He is unable to pay for an attorney, and he also refused to give his DNA. It's not suspicious at all, is it? Anyways, there's some more filings I have not had time to even look at. I'll go through those tomorrow. We'll keep our eye out for anything Valo Daybell related. We should have a trial date this week, and it will be sometime in October. We are going hyper speed, so going to be a busy, busy, busy few months for Pretty Lies, and we hope you guys will stick with us. All right. Have a good evening.